Welcome to the Startup Grind. Good, good evening, everybody. My name is Rich Foreman, and uh, welcome to Startup Grind. Uh, just to tell you, uh, I'm the uh, founding director, and my day job is I'm the CEO of Aptology. So, uh, as uh, the Startup Grind tra tradition, I'd like everyone to stand up, please. And uh, what I'd like to do is I'm going to introduce you to Robert Winkler, and uh, he is the CEO and co-founder of Fifth Planet Games. He's got four, four hit games with, uh, is it five or four? Uh, four. Four. Yeah. Uh, Seventy people working for him. It makes about $10 million in revenue. Just recently featured in the Sacramento Business Journal. has a nice whole page spread. And uh, really, just give him applause. He's a rock star. And thanks for showing up. Thank you. And uh, I'd also like to point out, Kate Dyer was supposed to be here, and he filled in for the last minute. So I'm very appreciative. So yep. thank you very much. No All right. So we'll go ahead and start. And uh, just to, but the way I'm going to do this, I'm going to basically start, start off with, by doing, you know, talking about you as a person. Okay. We'll go talk about uh, Fifth Planet Games and then maybe general entrepreneurship. Okay. So right after that, where are you from? Um, I was born in a little city called Aptos by Santa Cruz. Uh, okay. I was raised in Stockton, um, and I've lived in uh, Roseville for like the last 15 years or so. so Roseville, okay. Yeah. So what did you want to do when you grew as a little boy? What did you want to do when you grew up? Ah, uh, that's a good question. Um, I, I was always into video games. I never thought it was a viable, uh, you know, career choice for me. Um, I I always liked numbers, so um, I got started like in finance really young. Um, mm -hmm. You know, right out of high school, I started working at a bank as a teller and kind of, you <laughs> okay. know, um, always always worked around numbers for a really long time. Um, as a boy, though, I guess I would say playing the NFL, which again was very unrealistic because I was slow and not very tall, so. Uh, didn't have much of a chance, so. That's a noble pursuit, though. Yeah, yeah. And then uh, this, well, this is actually a stumper for my last guess. What is your favorite movie? Favorite movie? Um, I, 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 I watch a lot of movies. Um, it, it depends. Um, maybe that I've seen recently. Um, I really, I actually just saw the recent X-Men movie. I like superhero movies a lot. Okay. They're, they're exciting. They're I fun. would never know, actually. I know, I know, seriously. <laughs> this, is, this is my normal work attire, so you know, I, I dressed up for the occasion. Um, favorite movie, um, you know, I, I like a lot of the classics, like um, you know, Shawshank Redemption comes to mind. Okay. You know, I, I like movies that move me emotionally, that right. I have some sort of emotional reaction. I was talking to Brandon earlier, talking about how big of a sap I am. It's like, you know, usually, uh, you know, I, I cry a lot. Like, I cry at work about stuff. Like, you know, I get, especially when I get in front of the team. But, like, you know, movies, if they can move me, if they can bring right. me, you know, to tears, either from joy or, you know, sadness, right. then. Let me write it. Sap. Happy. Okay, hold sap. on. Sap. I'm a big sap. <laughs> yeah. Pretty emotional guy. Uh, all right. So, outside of Fifth Planet Games, what are your favorite video games are notable? Oh, I, I could list off a ton. Um, you know, there, there was g games that were important to me as I was as I was growing up that I really liked. Like, you know, personally, Tecmo Super Bowl was amazing. You know, mm -hmm. I loved playing that as a kid on you know, Ape Nintendo. Um, Final Fantasy VII was probably what I would categorize as one of the, one of, if not the best game ever made. Just because for me, because mm -hmm. it showed me that really that was the transition between a game and art, and it really had a really amazing story and narrative, and it really kind of used technology in a different way. Um, one of my favorite games of all time would be Portal. Um, it was you know, like a first person kind of physics puzzler and it really mm -hmm. created a new genre and I thought that was really amazing. I mean, just like the first time I played it, I found it like one night at 11 o'clock at night and I think I played it for probably six hours or something. It was like, it was light out when I stopped playing it yep. and I was just so immersed in like this new thing that had never existed before. Okay. So those are some of my Portal. favorites I would say. And then, uh, let's see. So I, uh, I know that, uh, actually this I found out from Sarda, but you're basically, you dropped out of college, right? Yes. Twice, actually. Twice. Yeah. So it was like Sierra Community College or something. So um, yeah. So I, when I first when I first uh, graduated high school, I went to college in in Aptos, uh, and um, I was playing football. I you know was doing all the stuff I wanted to do. Again, I was really terrible. I don't know how I made the team, but I wasn't going to play much anyways. Um, but I got mono and Ooh. just on my butt for a couple months, and so um, I had to drop out of school. I had to stop playing, and then I was just like, oh, I got nothing to do, so I'll find a job. So I started working. Um, really liked what I did um, at the bank, and then uh, I, I tried to go back to school, just never got any traction. I liked making money more. That was really mm -hmm. a lot of fun for 18. And then um, about six years ago, um, I was working uh, doing a life insurance and financial planning, and I really liked that, but 
I had three kids and it was really hard to balance the nights and weekends, you know, working and the nights and weekends with the family. And I uh, decided to go back to school. Um, I wanted to become a uh, math teacher, again, okay. you know, loving numbers. And um, went to Sierra for two years. And right at the end of my second year was when, um, it was about a month before we launched our first game. We had been in the company oh, so about you, a year. Oh, so you did this while you were at school? Yeah. And so, working? Yeah. Okay. And um, so I had to, I finished, um, I almost finished my second year. I actually got accepted to UC Davis. I got a, a full ride academic scholarship and um, really? got wow. the region scholarship and I had to turn it down because the game was launching. I had to pick one and my wife said, you get one chance to, uh, to make this game thing work and then after that you have to get a real job. So uh, she was very supportive. I was very lucky that I made this work. Um, so yeah, I, uh, I, that's something I intend to go back and finish someday just because I, I enjoyed school at that mm -hmm. point, you know, when I did it for me and not because, you know, I was forced to do it when I was younger. Right. Um, but yeah. And, so you, and you did all this while you had three kids. Three kids at the time, yeah. All we right. have five kids now. Oh my right. Yes, that's the normal reaction. Oh my gosh. It's my reaction too. So. I, I, I always tell people, so <laughs> I wish I was an entrepreneur when I was single and I could live in someone's garage, you know, oh, yeah. parents garage or have roommates. But, you know, having kids and, and makes <laughs> paying it a mortgage, it's... But I think it makes you hungry. I mean, like, I, 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 I'm a different person, you know, I, now than I was when I was a kid, when mm -hmm. I was single. Um, you know, it's definitely, there's an underlying driving force when that, you know, you just don't want to do something. You, you have people that are relying on you. You, know, yeah. you have to get it done. You have to. You so. have to look at them. And I didn't have that when I was young. You know, I definitely have that now. Yeah, that's definitely true. Actually, I remember talking to uh, my last boss. Basically, he likes to hire people with children because they're going to work harder. Yeah. <laughs> um, and actually, this is a side, but I actually met your brother-in-law, and uh, he said he, you got in trouble at the bank for playing games or something. I, I, what's the story behind that? Yeah, it's actually happened a couple times. Um, I've always been a big gamer. Like, it's always been a big part of my life, you know, since I was a kid. Um, and then, you know, once uh, the rise of kind of MMOs, like massively multi, uh, multiplayer online mm -hmm. games, like World of Warcraft and things like that, those really kind of sucked me in. So um, there was a time when actually I was working in New York Life, and when you have your own computer, and I was like raiding, you know, when I was supposed to be working in the bullpen. <laughs> that was not, that was not, uh, people didn't really like that. I was definitely frowned upon. Um, yeah, at the bank, um, there's times like I would play, you know, it was, I only had a browser there, so I couldn't download World of Warcraft on there, but I found like I really like Risk, and I found like a site where I could play online competitively, and I was ranked, you know, at one point I was ranked the top 10 in the world, and it was just like, I was playing like as, way too much. I, I'm glad there weren't smartphones then, because like I would have been unemployable at that point. I mean, it it would have been bad. I, I would have played way too many games. So, yeah, uh, I, I'm glad that I found an industry that work is play and play is work. So. That is that's pretty cool. So I have to say, so I, I think it's pretty cool, you know, that you have you have this passion for gaming, and uh, I could easily say I have a passion for comic books, but I'm not going to go write a, a comic book or whatever. So how did you go from having this passion for gaming to developing Fifth Planet Games? That's a good question. I mean, it was, it like I said, it was never really like something that was super intentional. It was something that was like more of a dream, and it would be cool to try to do something. But it was never like, okay, this is going to be my career. I'm going to sacrifice everything to do this. Not, at least not the beginning. Um, it was. It started with a group of friends that um, we played a lot of games together. We mm -hmm. actually played a lot of World of Warcraft, and kind of got to the point where I had to decide: Do I want to stay married, or want to keep playing World of Warcraft? I chose stay married, so that was the right choice. Um, but I had to. I had to cut back on the game. But I saw the friends that were playing it, and um, so we'd still hang out, talk about games a lot, and then, you know, we'd always you know, like normal people that play games and, you know, spend time on the internet do, we complain about them and things we'd do better and what they were doing mm -hmm. wrong. And then we just kind of eventually decided we should try to make something. And it started more as like a hobby and then just kind of quickly just turned into like we could actually do something that might So mean, what, mean what was your first game? Uh, our first game, so we actually started making a browser-based MMO. So kind of similar to World of Warcraft, but it was an, a, mm. a horrible idea. We were never going to make that game. You know, we worked on it for a long time. It would have taken forever. Um, and, but that's really kind of what got us interested in the space. It got me out kind of learning as much as I could. I went to like every conference I possibly could and just tried to, you know, taking notes all the time and, and trying to learn as much as I could. And I learned that what we were doing was a really bad idea. And so <laughs> instead of just stopping, I had to figure out, okay, well, what else could mm -hmm. we do? And, and that was kind of the, this was 2009. So it was the rise of Facebook gaming mm -hmm. and just that kind of got beaten in my head for a while. I didn't have a Facebook account. And, 
you know, once I did, I was just like, this isn't interesting. I don't want to play farming games. I don't right. want to poke people. And so, I, but I I'd found that there was, you know, there were people like me that were on Facebook that were underserved and that we could take what we had learned from this first game that never got really made um, and make a game for Facebook. And that actually became Dawn of the Dragon. So our first game, luckily, was, was very successful and um, was able to kind of support and grow the company. All right, so that was just a hobby. And then, so tell me about, the, you know, who, who, who is this, this, your gang here that, that put this together? So there was a, it was a group of friends that, um, one of them I met in kindergarten, uh, <laughs> one of them I met in high school, and one of them I met uh, playing uh, EverQuest, which is the game we played a lot before right. World of Warcraft. Um, and so they had lived, you know, different places throughout the years, but eventually, you know, a, a couple years before we started this, we'd all kind of congregated in the Roseville area. Mm -hmm. And so they were just, you know, again, we were like, you know, I was the guild leader and the raid leader, and they were the officers, and we just ran these guilds together and did stuff. So okay. uh, we, were, we spent a lot of time together. Um, wow. But they were like, um, two of them worked at Intel, and one of them worked at a different software development company. So they were, you know, already in tech. You know, I was interested in tech, and... Um, so we already kind of had some. So you, had, you must have had a program in your eyes. So that they, that was the other one. That was not me. I'm I'm, I'm more of the design guy. In the right. beginning, I was more of the, the business guy. But we had the programming. No one could draw to save their lives. So that was something we had to right. figure out very quickly. Was um, you know how could we convince an artist to come work with us for very little to no money? Because that's what we had was very little to mm -hmm. no money. Um, we we found out actually a guy that was employee number one still with the company. He was okay. he's our director, and. Um, yeah. So. So basically, you you started out as a game, and it started making money. Yeah. And then that's where really Fifth Planet Games kind of rose from. Yeah. Um, we a lot of our company, like the, our name, is based in like the lower mythology of our worlds. So it's always been kind of like you know the company and the games have always kind of gone hand in hand. Mm -hmm. and, you know, it's really it influences the culture. It influences everything that we do. Um, but yeah, our first game was successful. We were only about five people when we launched it. Um, we made back all the money that we had spent on it in the first month, and so you know, which wasn't a lot. I mean, it was like it was eighteen thousand dollars in our first month, which was you know for us we were you know, we were rich. Wow, so that was amazing. That's actually that yeah, that is pretty cool. Um, and then you know the next month we made fifty, and we we're like, holy crap, this might actually work. And so we decided at that point, do we want to just you know ride this one game for all it can be, or do we want to really make a go at this? Do we want to become a game development studio, and so we decided that we wanted to do that. We wanted to make more games. We wanted to try and just grow this. So we reinvested everything, everything in the company. We weren't, you know, the founders. Uh, there's two of us at that point. weren't taking any money at all. We were just, um, you know, putting on sweat equity, and we were using that money to fund a little bit of advertising, but mostly hiring other people. Uh, a couple months later, we got our office and started working on our second game that we got out about six months after our first game. So at this point, are you still working at the bank, or did you quit no. the bank? So I, I quit. Um, I had, at that point, dropped out of school. Um, I had taken student loans that I was basically living on that. I was, like, oh. mowing lawns on the weekends. I was doing everything. We, my wife had actually gone back to work and um, was working uh, during the day to try to, like, make ends meet. I mean, we were living on, on nothing at that point. Right. Um, and uh, so that was that was tough, but it was like at that point we had seen the light at the end of the tunnel. Like, okay, just you know, a few more months. We need to to hire like a, a you know more artists. We need to hire more people mm -hmm. to get the second game out the door and and get stuff done. And, and um, so, at what point would you like? Were you sort of comfortable? Like, how many months into this were you comfortable? I've never been comfortable. I mean, it's always it's always um, you know a hustle and it's a lot of work and. Um, you know, it was, it was really, I guess, the closest thing would be maybe after the first month, after we knew we had a viable product, mm -hmm. it was kind of like, it was more of a mind shift, like, okay, it's not the what if or can we, it was like, okay, how, how do we do it? And so that keeps you hungry, it's just in a different way. And it is, a, you know, I sleep pretty well at night and I have for a while now, just, but it's, it's um, a different focus. Um, but I, would, I, I guess I wouldn't say I've ever been really been comfortable because there's always something else that's going on. There's always the next game that we're making, right. always the next way that we're growing or the next market that we're going into that I have to learn about, that I have to explore. And it's just like, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm learning about new things all the time. And so okay. it's exciting. It's fun. All right. So I want to ask, what was fifth, what, how, what's the origin of Fifth Planet Games? I wouldn't quite get that. Great. Yeah, no. Um, so it's funny. The, the name. The, yeah. Is. So people, whenever we talk about the, the name, they start counting the planets. You can see in the, the, the eyes kind of roll up, and they're like, ah, they're like Jupiter. And so for a long time, we were joking that on the back of our cards, um, 
I won't say this on camera, but it's, it's not effing Jupiter. It was going to be like our company sl slogan because um, between uh, Mars and Jupiter is actually the asteroid belt. And so the, the, the story of our, of our like, universe is basically that used to be a planet, which is not actually true. That was debunked you know, a long time ago. But that used to be a planet, and that's where our games take place. And this was you know, tens of thousands of years ago. That's where um, basically you know, there was dragons, there were elves, there was humans. That's where everybody lived together. And so eventually that world exploded. That was destroyed. Humans were relocated to Earth, but that's where our like mythology comes from. Uh -huh. Is that that stuff actually existed a long time ago on this planet? So everything takes place on that mythical fifth planet. So we have games that take pl you know place in the present day or in the future, but it's all part of that kind of timeline that that actually. Existed. So it's all in the same universe. Yeah, they're all interconnected. So you'll play you know a science fiction game that's in the future, and you'll have references to you know characters that were in Dawn of the Dragons, and these games are you know tens of thousands of years apart. All right. So, all right, and then uh, I and I actually had an opportunity to visit your uh, facility. You had this networking thing, and he, they have a, this 12-foot dragon in the lobby. What's the story about the 12-foot dragon? Um, so that was actually um, in our in our office before. We had a, a picture of that dragon. His name is Erebus. So we had a, a big, you know, fat head made and put on the wall in one in our office because um, our very first game was Dawn of the Dragons, and we've always kind of had dragon-focused stuff because that game was, mm -hmm. you know, kind of core, and we we built another game called Clash of the Dragons, and again, they all kind of take place together. Um, so when we, that was the first dragon in our first game, was the first big epic boss, you know, the big climax right. of the, when, our, when we launched our first game. And so when we moved into the new office, we wanted to do something special and something different, kind of have that signature piece, especially in the lobby. So the, the funny story is that we actually didn't tell anyone. There was like three people in the company that knew that we had done this. And then our first day in the new office, we had everybody meet downstairs outside, and we had everybody walk up together and just see this dragon in the lobby. Um, and it's just a very kind of personal piece, too. I mean, it's something that's really important to us. Who would you find to make the dragon? So it's actually a local guy named uh, Shane Grammer. I mean, he's, uh, I couldn't believe it. We searched all over the United States. We found all these different places. I mean, we were researching this for a really long time and then just randomly found a guy, his, his studio's an antelope, oh. and just did an amazing job. He did it in three weeks. I mean, it was relatively affordable, especially compared to other people that were going to be shipping stuff here. Uh -huh. He just worked his butt off. He came in like it was done. Like He fi like finished it at 3 a.m. You know, the night before that we were starting our first day in the office. You find him like on Craigslist or something? No, just like <laughs> randomly, again, just randomly on the Internet with all these different places, and like, oh, yeah, he's located in you know, Antelope, California. You're like, that's amazing. So oh. it was just... It all kind of serendipitous the way that works That's out. That's pretty cool. And actually, do you have your? Let me show, show your people your business card. Yeah, I think I have. So he has the coolest business card yeah, I've have. ever seen. If you guys get a chance to get it, and if you, it looks like um, there's a card game called Magic. Yeah. And uh, I, I actually still to this day it's the coolest card. Thank you. What's What's the story about the? You know, how'd you design the business cards? So um, we actually have um, one of our games is a card game. So this is this is actually like a card in the game. Oh. Okay. And so we decided to take that for our business cards. You know, change some of the stats and put you know phone numbers and email and stuff in there. And it's it's always been, um, you know, we wanted to do things differently and do things fun. You know, um, so it's always been just kind of. A, uh, a special thing that we did. Okay, it, so, it's it's really really cool. No, it's been effective too. It's uh, there's a funny story that, that um, I'm a big uh, fan of you know fantasy and different stuff and um, big fan of Felicia Day who does the Guild um, web series and a bunch of other really cool stuff. I met her at a conference a couple years ago and just you know she was really busy but I gave her my card. I said you know I'd love to work with you someday and that was it. And then about a year later. Um, I got introduced through someone else and actually had a meeting with her and gave my card again. She's like, oh, I remember you. You had that awesome card. She's like, yeah, I told people about it. That's the coolest business card I've ever seen. I was like, that made it worth it right there. And so, you know, we actually ended up working together and then we had her characters in, in Dawn of the Dragons for about six months. Mm -hmm. And just like, you know, she's one of my favorite people in the world that I've ever worked with. And it was just really cool that like, Give me that card, you know, a year apart, and totally connect everything right. for her. So. And I said the moral story is make, a, make your own cool business Memo card. Memorable business card can, yeah, definitely be some value. So, uh, actually, it sounds like you're, you're, were you completely self-funded? Yeah. Wow, that's, that's pretty cool. That's, that's always, like, when I talk to other entrepreneurs, that's, that's, the, uh, that's the tough part. Yeah. Um, all right, so, uh, I guess, the, the, what's the process, of, what, what is the proce process involved in developing a, a game, a game concept? That's hard. Um, you know, it's it's been different for every game. Um, at its core, we we build games for people like us, so mm -hmm. that makes it a little bit easier. Mm -hmm. You know, what is fun for me? You know, right. somebody that played a lot of these kind of hardcore games at night couldn't really get away with it during the day because I would get in trouble. 
um, at work. But you know, so we, we felt with the browser, with Facebook, with all of these, you know, these lower lower barriers to entry, that um, we felt that there was a demographic of, of players that were underserved. And so when we step back and look at what's the next game we want to make, like what what do we feel that's not out there right now? What's something that, that we're having a lot of fun playing, or you know, close to something that's playing that doesn't exist? Um, so we've always spent a lot of time just, you know, figuring out what we would want to play. So you're not really trying, you know, definitely you're not trying to be like the next Candy Crush or nope. Flappy Bird. No. You're building games that you would want to play yourself. Absolutely. Because that's the only way that we can really check to make sure it's fun. I mean, we, we could do, uh, uh, you know, different, you know, case studies and A-B tests and we could do focus groups and things like that. Mm -hmm. But that's not something that we're passionate about. I mean, a lot of this is really hard work. I mean, people joke like, oh, you have the easiest job in the world. It's, it's a lot of hard work. Yeah. It was a lot of 100-hour weeks yeah. for a long time. And, you know, sometimes that's, that's really hard to get out of bed, you know, when yeah. you've slept at the office, you know, the next morning to keep working on stuff. And if it's not something that you're passionate about, you're, you're, you're going to stumble. And, right. you know, not that we didn't stumble along the way. We absolutely did it at different times. But it just, it makes driving, empowering through that stuff a lot easier. Mm -hmm. um, so it was never, like, we've never considered going outside of, you know, what we would find fun. Okay. So it makes it a lot easier to come up with the ideas because, you know, I always describe that, People ask me, you know, what, what's the best thing about your job? Is like, I get to go into work and say, wouldn't it be cool if, and dot, dot, dot. Whatever that is, we can do that. And it's nice that that ties into the things that we're doing. It's not like we have to go on some crazy tangent. It's already tied into the stuff we're creating and the stuff that we want to do. Okay. Uh, so, I, actually, I was like, when, I, when you're in developing games, you have to build a story. Is it, it sounds like it's, you know, I don't know, is it it's like you have to have a storyline? Um, yeah, it depends on the game. Um, as a company, we focus more on story-driven and thematic, uh, you mm -hmm. know, elements. There's a lot of companies that, that don't. I mean, especially, you know, in mobile, there's just not a lot of space for it even sometimes. Right. Um, but, yeah, we really, since we want to be immersive with our experiences, we really want people to get into it, um, we work really hard on that. Like, what's the... What's the motivation? What's the theme? What's the setting? Even though people might not read all the words, like uh, Dawn, for example, it's now over a million words. It's like, you know, we've broken it out to something like 17 novels if we, if we took all the text out and, and put wow. it in the books. I mean, it's like an insane amount. I haven't even read it all. I mean, I don't, besides the guy that writes it, I don't know that anybody has read it all in, in, at, um, from so one person. So you actually have like a, a story writer? Or yeah, we have no? three. Okay. We have three full-time writers. Wow. And so that's something that separates us, too. And usually it's, you know, somebody that does design or art or something that writes the story or the, the verbiage. I mean, we, we take that stuff very seriously because there are people that really get into it. But even the people that don't, they, it's kind of funny, but they appreciate that it's yeah. there because they get glimpses of it. They don't, you know, read every line of every zone of every, of, you know, every game, but they know that everything ties together and everything makes sense. And especially when you're connecting worlds between different games, you know, it's easier to keep that stuff all there and it's like those little nods like you know a great example is the x-men movie that you know mm -hmm. that just came out is they have nods to all the other movies and all little things and the people that are passionate about it really appreciate that and it really draws them in like it shows that we care yeah. so even if they don't read everything it shows that we care and that this is important to us you're giving that yeah, okay and then you first started your first platform was facebook right yeah. uh and uh and i think the latest game is now on mobile yeah are you still going to con continue to produce games on Facebook, or are you more transitioning to more of a mobile platform? We're right? a mobile first company, but okay. we're absolutely going to put games on Facebook. Okay. I mean, it's just, we have a lot of players there. There's a lot of people that are looking to consume content like this. Um, it would, it just makes smart business are, are you Are you seeing a decline in Facebook users out of curiosity, or? No, it's about level. I mean, over the years, we've diversified onto other platforms, you know, including mobile, but sites like Congregate, Armor Games, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. It hasn't really diminished our Facebook traffic at all. It's just been really, you know, additive. Okay. So, but yeah, we're going we're gonna to continue to focus on both. And this is the $10 million question. T talk about, you know, and this is, I think, I've, I've talked to other gamers. Let's, you know, talk about how, you, you know, the monetization strategy. Um, and, uh, you know, like, and this is, I think, what, what a lot of people struggle, you know, developing games or developing apps. How, what is your strategy in, in developing, uh, you know, in making money, I guess? Yeah. Um, you know, it's, it's, I think it's almost cliche at this point, but it is very true. We focus on fun first. Mm -hmm. uh, we focus on immersion. Um, we are in it for the, you know, the long haul. We're not in it to try to see how much money we can make in the first 30 days or 90 days. Um, and we've seen that that works really well for us. Dawn, again, is a great example of, you know, we recently ran the numbers of the first thousand or the first 10,000 players that came into Dawn. Um, 7% of those are still playing today. 
and Dawn, actually today, May 28th, is its four-year anniversary. Really? So wow. we've had that game live for four years, and of the first 10,000 players, seven. I mean, that's, that's a good you know, 30 or 60-day retention for most games, right. and we're at that for four years. And so those players, you know, those are high monetizing players, and, and we're, we're looking for that kind of long-term potential and, and growth for players. So we've always tried to focus on let's keep them happy, let's keep them playing, the monetization will come. I mean, we can still tweak it. We still try to find things that we run games as a service. So we want, you know, we look at it maybe like a, a movie or something else. It's not a tangible product that you're going to be able to take home and put in your desk. It's going to be something that you need to enjoy the time that you're spending mm -hmm. in front of our game. And so we want to create entertainment value out of that. I think you're using the freemium model, right? Yes, absolutely. So they can play for free. Yep. And is it gems they ha if they want to get something else? Every game has a different premium currency, right. but yeah. But we give away some of that premium currency just for playing. Right. So we have it as part of like the daily rewards. If you log in you know, every day for a week, you get 10 of them, which is a couple bucks worth. And if you level every few levels, you get some too. So people that never spend anything can still get those premium items, but obviously not at the same pace for someone that's just you know, willing to spend what, you know, what they come up with. And there's, it, it works well for us because we, the communities, we, we're very, we focus more on cooperation than competition. We have both of those in our game. But we really want to focus on bringing people together and, and having monetization. Like when you spend money, you should feel good about it. You shouldn't feel like, oh, I get to kill random people. It's like I get to help my friends and I get to help my guild and we all succeed together. So how much, so I, you have these free users. So how much do you think the, you know, the person that actually pays, right, what the, on an average would the person that pays regularly pay? Um, it depends. There's so many different ways to track that. You know, our, our average rev revenue per paying users on all of our games is well over a hundred dollars a month or uh, that's or like a lifetime a lifetime okay. um it depends on the game and the different time i mean we have kind of a seasonal business um we have like right now it's um our dawn anniversary so yeah i mean right now during this month it's well over that too i mean it's it's significant during our our anniversary months um we don't have we have a you know decent conversion rate in terms of free to mm -hmm. monetizing users but yeah we usually go pretty deep on those users. And again, it's over a long amount of time. I mean, we have a lot of users that have spent tens of thousands of dollars on the game. All right, so the second part of the, the million dollar question is how do you market your app? How do you get people to try your app? With, you know? um, that's, that's part of the hard part too. Mm -hmm. And because we are really playing to a niche, you know, this isn't Candy Crush Saga. This isn't right. something that everyone can you know, identify with and is interested in. Um, that's one of the places that Facebook's actually really good, and it's, it's you know it's been easier for us as they've become bigger on mobile because they have so much data on people. We know that we're targeting a certain type of user um, oh. because we want to go after the males that are you know 18 to 35 that like World of Warcraft. I mean that the conversion rate on that is huge, and so nice. Facebook has all that information because you've liked World of Warcraft and you you know you have to give some information you're, you're, when you sign up, and so it's really easy just to show those ads to those people. And so um, it is harder to scale that because we, we, we obviously we have female players that are outside of that demographic, mm -hmm. but it's still it's you know it's a fraction of of the group of players that are more in our no normal target demographic. So we use we use you know Facebook their their you know laser targeting for ads for both web and mobile. Um, we've done some Google ad stuff where you can put it on you know different forums of different games that are similar to ours. Has that been effective? Yeah, it's all been. A, effective in different ways. I mean, Facebook has always been like the best for us mm -hmm. because they have so much information and because we have games on Facebook, we're not sending them somewhere else. Um, there's very low friction there. Um, and then we've partnered with people like Congregate that do all of the advertising for you. It's just a different rev share. And they have all those players, they have all the information and they're you know, incentivized to put, play, play, put players in front of our games too. So it's different on each platform, but um, that is an important part of what we do. Okay. So is there like a, and I, I remember talking, I think it's someone that you're, you were talking about the cost of acquisition. Yep. What, what is that typically like in versus like, you know, the return? Um, it varies. I mean, it, the return has always got to be higher than the cost. Right. Um, you know, we always have to spend ROI positive. Um, but it, it varies. Like web, we can still get users, depending on volume, you know, 10, 20, 30 cents a user. Um, and mobile, it's going to be, you know, Honestly, anywhere between fifty cents and five dollars. I mean, it can fluctuate a lot based on seasonality. Wow. It can fluctuate. Um, there's different ways on on both platforms, but it's more common on mobile to 
get um, incentivized installs through certain actions. Like we'll pay more for a user that not only plays our game, but defeats the first boss. Because we've seen in our analytics, if they defeat the first boss, you know, there's a very high percentage chance that they're going to come back the next day. And so there's uh, companies out there that will only charge you, you know, for a, a user that will get to that far in your, your new user funnel. Mm -hmm. So we'll pay three times as much because they're four times as likely to play, come back the next day. So it makes sense for, for both parties to do that. Okay, so they're really just, you're really working with companies that specialize in tar marketing, well, yeah. and then Facebook too. Facebook, we do it ourselves, right. um, but you know that's because we have a lot of experience with it. Um, they have ad managers that can help you, you know, optimize. But again, it's, we know who we're going after. We know who who mm -hmm. converts well, so we can do a lot of that ourselves. Okay. Um, what we talked about. Uh, so one of the things that um, you know, I remember you talking about at the start was you 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 talked about. Uh, uh, well, there's two questions. One is. Uh, you talked about hiring athletes, mm -hmm. and you want to talk more? Uh, yeah, that's been it's something we've always done, and that I've only been able to really articulate, I guess, recently, um, which it helps because you know we try to use analogies as, as a company as much as we can because people have different experiences. But usually, when we when we break it down to an analogy that people understand, it makes it easier. Um, but the the athlete analogy is that, especially in our industry, is that things move so fast, mm -hmm. things change so fast. You know, I had a discussion earlier about when we design a game. We come up with a theme, we come up with the design, and then we choose the technology. We're not a flash shop. We don't just make flash games. You know, mm -hmm. There are so many different other options out there, like the next game we're making right now is in Unity. We've never made a Unity game before, but we, we, didn't have, we never hired anyone you know, based on their resume in, in terms of Unity. But we had some people that had some experience with it, or we have people that are really good athletes. So the, the analogy I use with athletes is we don't, we don't go out and hire a quarterback because we need a quarterback or a receiver because we need a receiver. We hire people that can play multiple positions because we don't know where, not only where we're going to be deficient someday, where we just might you know, lose someone, um, or where we're going to head in the future. So we want people that can adapt very quickly to different positions, different languages, different ways of designing or thinking or styles of art, whatever it might be. It, it applies to everything that we do. Because we also have people that, we have quite a few people that have basically, it, it doesn't sound good, but have failed up, have come in at one position, haven't done well in what, what they specifically were hired to do, but they have an aptitude to learn, they have the right attitude, they have, you know, they're very passionate about our culture and about games. And so we find another position for them. Sometimes that's even a promotion. It's, it's hard to do that sometimes, but you kind of just get a feeling after you get to know someone and how they work, where they're going to be more successful. So the person that is the lead designer for Dawn of the Dragons, I mean, this is a good chunk of our revenue. He basically failed at his position before this that we hired him for as a community manager. But he had just shown like a proficiency for understanding this game and really kind of got it. And so we kind of took a chance on him. And he's been doing that for a year and a half now. And that game has just, you know, has only gone up since then. And so that's a great example of somebody that we hired that we knew could do other things beyond just the thing that we specifically hired them for. And we have you know, multiple cases of that, that were the, right, the first fit isn't always the right fit, but we, you know, they're on the bus, so we want to find the right seat for them. So you don't kick them off, you just kind of yeah. move them around. That's yeah, great. Trying to find the right fit. And then uh, I, I, I've seen it firsthand, but can you talk a bit about your, your company culture? Um, yeah, company culture is very important to us. It's definitely one of the things that, I guess, stands out when people come and visit or you know, they hear about us. Because there is a lot of the kind of gaming cliches about you know the bean bags and Nerf guns and you know free candy and we have all that. Um, you got free candy? Yeah, we have free candy. Oh wow! We have so it's funny the the story I tell too is that my dad is like you know he's he's pretty proud of what we did. My dad's kind of a low key guy though, but when he tells people about the company, he's like, yeah, they got this all this stuff and they have vending machines that are free. <laughs> I mean that's like the thing that like really stands out to him is that you know one of them is a bunch of soda and the other one is stocked with like chips and candy. They're all set to free vend, and that's just like the news crews that have come out and shown it. They always hit the vending <laughs> machines. They always, like, some segment about it. They just, I, I don't know why, but um, if we had, it, like, the candy in a bowl next to the vending machine, or it, it wouldn't have been as cool. It's just the fact that it's in a vending machine, it, it's, it, it makes it really fun. But um, th those are the things that are important to us, though, is that we want people to feel like they're special. Um, you know, those are the things that are obvious when you walk through the offices. You know, like, a, almost a, about a fourth of our office is just kind of like the rec area where we have a bunch of big screen TVs with Xboxes, and we have ping pong tables and pinball machines and all kinds of stuff. Um, and we have a lot of gaming rooms. We have you know, over 100 board games now, and we have a board game night every week where we get together and play different games. Um, 
but it, it's a Why lot. Why would you want to even go home? <laughs> I know. It, it, we, have, we have people that we've had to tell, you can't sleep here. You have to go home. You know, they'll be there all night doing something. And they're just like, Why would I? there's a couch here. There's, you know, there's all this stuff. Why would I go home? Like, you know, get a home shower, come back in the morning. Not healthy. Um, but we, we do have people that eat most of their meals. I think there's people that probably eat all of their meals at the office because we have a, a ton of food. Yeah, they, they, hopefully it's not just the vending machines. Hopefully it's, you know, we have a bunch of frozen food and we have food catered every once in a while and stuff too every week. Um, but it's the stuff that I think that's really important, the stuff that people don't usually see. It's the, you know, the intentional events that we do is that, like, you know, we rented out the theater last mm-hmm. night to go see the new X-Men movie. And, you know, it's a 280-person theater. And we had about 100 people there. So everybody had a good seat. We were all together. We got to experience something that was really fun together. Um, we've played, like, kickball. We had, you know, team kickball. We're really competitive, so we have trophies for everything. Uh, we run magic leagues. Um, but we also, we also pay 100% of our benefits for all of our employees and all of their dependents. And so those are things that, you know, for the young kids, that's not a big deal. But for people like me that have a family, like, that means a lot. Right. And that shows that the company cares and that, Families are important. Work-life balance is important. And so um, those are things that we don't talk about a lot. You don't see a lot, but really kind of help with the vision and kind of set the foundation of we're going to take care of our team and they're going to take care of us. So. Well, there was a question. Actually, there was a question. On your, on your bio, you said something about the fifth level of something. Oh, of world domination? Yes. Yeah, what, what is the fifth level of world domination? It's a secret. Okay. No, it's, 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 it's ever-changing. It's, it's, um, All right, what's your plan for world domination? Let's just put it that way. Uh, my plan for world domination. I, had this, I asked Pam the same question. Um, <laughs> it, it's, it's the happy, friendly, everybody hold hands world domination plan. So, but it's, um, honestly, I believe that, you know, it's something that I've been, I've been focusing on more in the last, I don't know, six months or year is that, is that there are opportunities to, to change the world and that we need to find those where you can make your mark and you need to take them. And I've been more and more involved, like in the local community here. Right. I you know, recently joined the board of SARTA, and because I like the stuff that they were doing, the direction they're going, and I felt that's a place that I could mm-hmm. personally make an impact with my time. And you know, the more that I've, you know, been speaking and, and doing more stuff, I've tried to use it as a platform to promote Sacramento, because I feel that it, it's a great example of how there's a better life in what we do. I see, yeah. I know so many people. I see so many people that live in the Bay Area that just yeah. grind it out and like. They don't sleep, they don't eat, they just kill themselves working and because they have to make a deadline, they have to have, hit a ship date, and it's just, it's really hard. And so I want to show, so my, my plan for world domination is to show people there's a better way to live and there's a better life out there, even in our industry, which n- notoriously is bad for work-life balance. All right. So. All right, let's see. Kind of a backwards plan. I'm not, I'm not. All right, uh, and then I guess the, the you know this is something I was thinking about, and I imagine you must have these meetings. How do you decide on what's your, going to be your next tr- new project? So that's kind of been an iterative process over time. Like we've changed that. Um, so what we're what we do now is we call um, it's called like our rapid prototyping uh, process. So it's actually like a full blown. There's a guy that leads this process. That's all he does in our company. Um, we take uh, it starts with like a submission of ideas, and anyone in the company can submit any idea. And um, we have like a, um, he'll go and work with them and kind of flesh out their idea a little bit. Then we'll have like a presentation phase where there's a group of us that are on the design side. Since we are very much a design-led company, we want to we wanna sit down and like understand it and like, you know, go through those, is it fun, you know, is it business viable? That's, you know, important too. Um, and how would we, you know, work, how would it work within our Do you culture? look at every idea or? Yeah, it, absolutely. Okay. I mean, and we spend a good chunk of time going through it and asking questions. So. You know, we just did a sub- we just did this process uh, a couple months ago, and we had like 14 people that submitted different ideas. Actually, about 10 people. Come, some people had multiple ideas. We sat down, went through every one. Give you know, people have worked hard on this, and it's something that they're passionate about. So, you know, we make sure to give them as much time as possible to do talk you give about them, like, it. Like a, a presentation sheet, like they have to do. Yeah. Okay. They have like a format, and they mm-hmm. you know they don't have to stick exactly to it, but it, it kind of helps. Because some of these people aren't designers; they're on the tech side or they're on the art side, and they don't you know, haven't done a design doc before. So we, we help, we have that there more, mostly to help them kind of focus. Um, and then we have the, the guy there that helps um, with all that too, to help them kind of hit the target. And so we'll, we'll start with that. And that kind of helps set a direction and a vision. And so like the game that, that, that we're working on right now that I'm heavily involved in, we actually have set up a war room. I, I, I don't sit in my office a lot. I usually will sit out, you know, with the team that I'm working on a project. Or right now, we've actually set up a war room in one of our conference rooms that everyone's working on this new game. It was one of the ideas pitched in this rapid prototype. It was a very loose idea, 
but it was enough that we kind of like, okay, that could be really cool. But if we did this, this, and this, and we added these, and we, you know, did this, that would be a game that would fit really well, you know, into what we want to do. It would be something that we would play. And so it, you know, if you look from what he pitched to where we are right now, I mean, they're very different, but you can see the core, the essence of the, of the, the game is still there. And so that was like, you know, it's more for inspiration than a really kind of fleshed out idea. Um, you, you, how many big projects do you go on, like uh, new projects do we work on in a year? Usually it's about one a year. We're doing two right now. You know, that's one of the nice things is we continue to so grow. So how many submissions do you normally get from your internally for that? Um, it depends. Um, sometimes we've only got a handful. This one was a bigger one because it had been a while since we had submitted, you know, had this process. Because mm -hmm. we had worked on a big project last year that we actually ended up killing before it went live. It just wasn't, oh, wasn't really? viable. Okay. That, that's actually that been hard. It was very hard. We had a, you know, a team of about between five and eight people working on it for about nine months. And you just killed the project. Yeah. It was, it's, it's not completely fair to say this, but you know, it, the best way I can summarize it is that at the end of the day, it just didn't have a soul. Like it didn't make, it was, the tech was really good, the design was really good, the art was really good, but it just didn't fit together in a way that, that ultimately I felt was something that I wanted to represent us. Again, all those individual pieces were good. They just didn't fit together. It was almost like, and again, I don't want to be negative, but it was like, almost like a Frankenstein. Like it had all these pieces, and it, it worked and it lived, but it wasn't special. It wasn't unique, and it wasn't up to par. So um, we we killed it before it went live. Well, that's hard. That's a hard decision. Yeah, no, it was. It, we we didn't launch a game last year, and that was that was tough from a business perspective. But wow. it was the right decision because, you know, we don't we don't want to ever shut a game down. We've had to do that once, and it's not ever fun. You know, because people get really attached to the stuff that we do. We get really attached to the stuff that we do. Right. So. Yeah. Oh, so, so I want to go more with the general stuff. What? Sure. And there's actually I've talked to a few people that are actually very interested in gaming, or in the gaming business. What, what advice would you give to a budding, uh, you know, person that wants to make a, you know, go into the gaming business? Um, specifically gaming, I would say, make something that you're passionate about. Um, I talked to a lot of people that, you know, ask these questions, and they have a company that's not doing well because they're trying to hit a certain demographic. They hear that, you know women 34 to 56 monetize really well in puzzle games, so they're going to make a puzzle game for that demographic. And no one in that company is, you know, anywhere near that, that demographic. It doesn't understand, you know, those games. Um, I, I think the number one thing is to make something you're passionate about. I mean, we talked about it earlier. Of it helps just, you know, helps you, you know, break through some of the barriers that you're going to have, but it helps you understand what you're trying to do and I think make a, ultimately a better product. Um, I think that's, just critical. I mean, beyond that, I've seen a lot of people that still do that, but don't understand the business side of things, mm -hmm. and so they make just kind of catastrophic, you know, um, mistakes sometimes in terms of whether it be not, you know, not getting good advice from, you know, either uh, an attorney or a CPA, or not understanding the marketing side at all. They have a really good game, but they just don't know how to get in front of people. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are a lot of extra components that go into making games successful besides just making it fun and making right. it monetized. I mean, those are two huge, really hard things, but there's, you know, five other things that it takes to actually make this work. So, and that goes to the other part. So you're, you, let's say you make a successful game. What's the other advice? You know, let's say I made a game that I'm very passionate about. What's the other advice that you'd have for... Uh, Find good partners is probably the number one thing. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Congregate has been, a, um, you know, a big partner of ours for a long time. They... They were good at the things that we were not good at. I think, you know, being able to identify, we can make a good game, but we have no idea how to market it at the beginning. Like, we don't know how to get in front of people. So we went to a site like that that was really good at that. You know, they were good at bringing users to their site and putting users in front of the right games. And so we said, we have this game. We think it's going to do really well. It's already done really well on Facebook. You know, can you help us? And then, you know, within a month, that was the number one game on their site. And it's been the number one game on their site since then. And, you know, that was almost two, that was over two years ago. So Congregate was this, this, this partner that sort of helped yeah. you out. So they were a, a gaming site just for, you know, Flash-based games, and they have other games there now, too. But they were, they were really good at getting users in front of games, and we were really good at making a game, but not good at that. So we were able to find a good partner in that. We were able to, you know, to get our second game out the door, we had serious bottlenecks in art. So we were able to find a, um, a, an art house that was looking to get, you know, into more game design and was willing to do a rev share deal instead of charging us for the, for the art. So we got you know, $250,000 worth of art for, for nothing up front. We just got that, you know, we gave them a rev share on the game and we agreed to kind of open up the, the design and let them kind of see it so they could eventually make their own games. And it worked really well for us. We, we found a partner 
that was able to provide something that we weren't able to provide. So that, you know, we got a game out six months after our first game instead of, you know, a year or two when we actually had the would have, would have had the money to, to build it. So okay. yeah, it's just a, a lot of it was identifying what we weren't good at and where we could find someone to fill that in terms of a partnership. Okay. Uh, at this point, I'm going to let the audience uh, ask questions. And uh, we're mic'd up, so if you ask a question, I'm going to try to repeat it, and then uh, Rob will try to answer it. So any try questions? Or I'll answer it. The, the athletes kind of, you know, analogy that we use is that we're, we're less concerned in an interview when we're, when we're meeting someone what they can do. It's more about how they can do it, why they do it. Um, you know, I sit in on every interview still, and my questions are always like the, what's your favorite video game? Why? You know, and I'll, I'll ask them, what's the best video game ever made? I'll really put them on the spot and like, you know, see how they answer that. And if they answer with conviction, you know, then it's the right answer. But if they like don't know, and those are, those are things I'm just trying to get at, like, why are they here? Why do they want to work for us? I mean, as we've changed, like, it was hard to find talent at the beginning. Now we get 50 to 200 applications for every position. And so it, you, we get people that are very well qualified. We've made mistakes with hiring over time, and we've had to let people go um, because they didn't, you know, they had a good resume, and maybe they could produce pretty well, but they weren't a good culture fit. And we you know, kind of compromised on that because we wanted to get someone in here with experience. And we've learned from those mistakes that we focus more on can they figure things out, but are they a good fit for our culture, you know, um, instead of what their resume is. I mean, a lot of the positions we hire for that I hire for on the design side, I don't even look at the resume. I mean, it's, 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 it's almost irrelevant. I mean, it's a little more important on the tech side. They have to have some ability to program. Or on the art side, they have to be able to draw in some capacity. Um, but it's much more about who they are and, and why they're here. It almost yeah. seems like you're looking for someone that's very passionate. Um, it has to be. That's, you don't even, you shouldn't even apply if you're not very passionate about so what we're doing. So they give a non-passionate answer, they're pretty much they're out. Gone. Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. Any other questions? Questions? All right, so let me see. Where do you see that like the console business going? Yeah. What's the future of console gaming? Yes. Yeah. Okay. I don't think it's dead. Um, I don't think it's going to grow. Um, I'm still a big console gamer. I still play like Titanfall every night for a couple months now. I'm pretty addicted to that game mm -hmm. um, because I like the experience of having it on a big TV and just being immersed in it. Yeah. And I like Xbox Live. I, I have a, my, my brother lives in a different city that I don't see him very rarely, but I play with him every single night. You know, him and I get on and we just, we wreck shit together and it's fun. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, you could probably do that on a PC, but it's a little bit different. It's, it's, it's the experience of it. So I don't think that's ever going to go away, uh, especially now with Connect and, you know, the, you know, we really kind of changed the way that people interact with games in the living room. But I, I don't think it's going to grow because and it's not as much web, I think it's more mobile, is that those experiences are getting better, and it's an easier interface, it's, it's more accessible. You know, people are not only playing that, you know, to, to play a console game, you have to commit to it. It's not usually a five or 10 minute thing, is that you have to get everything set up. For me, it's getting all the kids in bed, it's like, yeah. you know, it's, I, I'm locked in at that point for a while. But, um, but that's, that's what the experience I'm looking for, so. Would you I, ever make a console game? No. It's just not anywhere on our radar. It's the, the cost to develop it is, is really, really high. I mean, there's some ways to lower that, but the success rate is so low. Um, discoverability is a hard, hard thing to fight. I mean, you, sometimes you literally have to fight for shelf space in Walmart or Target, and if you don't want with a big publisher, you're not giving up a lot of stuff. You can't do that. That's what's great about what we do is that like, if we make a good game, we can find partners like Congregate that will you know, push it in front of a lot of people, and it will it will snowball from there and take care of itself. So, no interest at all in console. Okay, I like you, playing them, but yeah, I yeah. agree. It's uh, and with kids, I I stopped playing console games because I don't want to be playing a game and having my kids walking while I'm chainsawing some monster yeah. or something. So, I still have little ones that just go and turn it off. I'm just like ah. Yeah, I, I stopped playing. I haven't played. I have like a like Halo Four, which I've never even opened out of the package, still sitting on my desk. It's a fun game. You should play it. Someday, yeah. When kids get older. <laughs> uh, Phil, how do, you, how do you get your people? Um, do you have in-house recruiting? Do you go to outside firms to get people? Uh, so the question is, how do you find your people? Um, it's a mix of a few different things. Um, we we have some in-house recruiting. We have an HR rep, full-time HR rep, that does some of that. She'll go out to career fairs and she'll go out to the Art Institute and things like that. 
Um, a lot of it, though, at this point is we'll just put a posting up and we'll promote it just really kind of like almost on our own Facebook feeds and stuff. And we have enough people that know enough people that kind of get it out there. There's a couple other, there's, there's a lot of free resources. I don't think we've really paid much, if anything, to hire the last 10 people or something. There are some key hires that we're, you know, we'll work with recruiters to get because these are people that are not necessarily looking for a job. Um, so we might have to, you know, hire a headhunter to go get some people for very specific things. But for the most part, that's, that's the benefit, I think, of being in our industry is that it is fun and exciting and the people that are passionate about it are looking for those jobs. They might be you know, in some, a different position somewhere, but we hire a lot of people that this is their first job in the industry. They've been in software development for 10 years, but they haven't been able to break in and they're out looking for that opportunity to do it. So, um, but there's, yeah, specifically for our industry, there's you know, different mailing lists and things that people are a part of that we can get the word out pretty easily. And then if they're looking, they have to be passionate, apparently. Absolutely. Uh, Very important. Uh, the questions? Yeah. You know, the false alarm. <laughs> some of the gamers here, I, I knew there's some people came from far that had any questions. Well, I'm, I'm uh, a casual gamer, but where do you see the, where do you see the future of gaming going? Where do you, and the question is, where do you see the future of gaming going? Um, I wish I knew. Um, I'd be a rich man. But, yeah. um, but I think... You know, there, there's there's um, you know some thought right now about wearable tech and things like that. Um, I don't know. I have to see how that gets implemented, but I don't think so. I think I think mobile gaming really is the future. Um, it is really accessible. You know, almost everyone has a smartphone at this point. Um, they provide so many other services. That the one of the hard things with web gaming for a long time was that barrier of entry, that the hurdles that people had to get to get your game in front of them. Facebook really knocked a lot of those down. People were on Facebook anyways, hey, I might as well play a game. Um, they weren't going to congregate to play games. It was really hard to attract users. That's why Facebook has over a billion users and congregate has a small, small, small fraction of that. Um, with smartphones now, everyone has one for the most part. So if we can you know, we fight a battle of discoverability there, but I really think that's going to be the dominant platform for a long time. Um, I don't see, you know, it kind of growing beyond that. I think that's what's going to stay. The web's always going to be important. You know, we're always going to focus on web. People are always going to have, you know, a browser at work, you know, and so we're always going to have games for them to play when the boss isn't looking, so. Top 10 in Risk, that's impressive. Yeah, I played a lot of Risk, <laughs> a lot of Risk. Um, and actually, any, well, one more, so a couple. Yeah. I think so, that's brilliant. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. So, uh, how would you phrase that? There's games where that actually have impact on the physical world. Yep. What's your? So, the, so I, I think that is the the future of MMOs. I think that that's really uh, actually pretty awesome. We do that stuff in our game where we have make permanent changes to the game. Um, in, in our games, we actually um, we have like these chases for legendary items that are really really rare. And the first person that finds it, we actually will name another uh, item after them. So they're, they're in our game immortalized forever. And they actually get to help influence the design and look oh. of, of that. And we think that that stuff is critical because like, that used to happen. You know, the big event for me in World of Warcraft, for those who played it, was the, the Gates of Encourage. When they opened, like, you, you permanently changed this world. And that was amazing. Like, that was something that I will never forget being part of that event for the rest of my life. And so we try to create that in some scale in our game with different things that we do. And I really think that's the, the, the future of, of MMOs and just kind of games in general is that, you know, those more immersive experience, you have to have some small ownership of that to really feel invested. And I think that it's great that, that more and more companies are kind of embracing that. Because it's hard. As a designer, you don't want to give up anything. You, know, you want to control the vision and voice and everything. So it's hard to do, but um, I think people are finally seeing the value in that, especially the big companies, which is cool. Anyone else another question here? So I'm, uh, I'm trying to see how to phrase that. So can we actually do actual character building, not the character, but the person building in games? Or some aspect of that? Yeah, like just games for social change, right? I mean, um, definitely thought about it. It's something that's important to me. Um, it's not something that as a company we have attempted to do. Uh, honestly, I, I, uh, my little brother, he lives um, in Austria, and he's, um, I've been helping him, and we've been talking about it a little bit. 
um, he's developing a game to help kids there learn English. And there's different ways that, you know, he came up with a game idea and we talked about it. Like, you know, they really like, um, you know, it's, it's hard to generalize, but like, you know, those like American Idol type games and want to be a pop star. And so there's ways that you can incorporate the things that are interesting to kids and help teach them at the same time. And there's actually tons of, of examples of that out there, out there right now. Like my kids play games and, and um, you know, there's, there's pre-K games that, that kind of help kids learn how to match colors and learn words. Um, as a company, we've never focused on that. We, you know, honestly, that might be something that we do someday just because that is something that I'm personally passionate about. But we um, haven't gone down that route yet. It's, just, it's not a, a, an area of expertise for us right now. And I've actually seen some seminar where people are talking about gamifying, where they're taking, you know, the, you know where you earn, trying to teach people skills mm -hmm. uh, and having, you know, either sales skills or, you know, kids learning certain skills and making a game out of it. And they could earn, like, rank or whatever. Yep. It's, it's, it's a great concept, and it's definitely gained momentum over the last few years, and I think we'll continue to do it because it's measurable goals. There's rewards based to it. It's easier for people to break that down. I mean, they've even talked about applying that to healthcare. You know, if you go get your wellness checkups, you'll, right. you know, those are really easy things that, oh, I can just do this, and then I'll get this, you know. Smiley face. Yeah. But there's, uh, there's all the reward programs that you get for different right. grocery stores and whatever else. I mean, that's basically gamification. I mean, they're just trying to get you to do something to give you a small reward at the end. Mm -hmm. so. Do you have a question, Kelly? I just had a quick business question, so not as exciting or passionate. That's okay. That's good for this, this format. So, So the question is, what kind of plans do you have to take your company global, and what are, what are the barriers you see? Um, it's definitely a big opportunity for us. We have not done much of that so far. The biggest barrier is a, kind of a self-imposed one, that the million words in one of our games, that's hard to translate. Oh that's going to be that's gonna be tough. Oh, wow. Um, I didn't think about that. So we, what we've done is that, you know, we'll, 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 we'll go back and, and look at some of that stuff, but as we continue to develop games, they're much more icon focus, they're less, like, the story, it, it matters a lot, but they're less focused on that. Um, so we can um, translate and localize those games. Um, because there is a, a huge opportunity. For the most part, a lot of, you know, um, a lot of gaming is focused on English speaking, you know, North America. Um, but there are tons of opportunity out there. We do really well in, you know, some other countries, but it's mainly English speaking, and it's, it's, honestly, it's a missed opportunity for us right now. So you're we'll actually looking at translating the games like to yeah. a different language. We have the technology set up. I mean, there's just, I mean, we got it to the point where it's just a drop down. It's just, it's just really hard, especially for our first two games that are super word heavy. Million so, dollar, million words. Yeah. yeah, it's, it's. Uh, we have a funny story that we actually um, contracted with a, a, a Chinese company to bring one of our games over there. The, the our second game, it's not quite a million, but it's, it's a lot of words. And we hear about three weeks later that the the guy that was in charge of this just rage quit. And he just <laughs> completely just, because it was like, this is, I mean, this is a professional writer that has published books. I mean, he is, um, he uses a lot of big words. And this, the, the translator, you know, that's the story at least that we heard. He, just, he hated it and just quit. And then they had to basically like almost start over. And then it just fell through and never, never Holy worked God. out. <laughs> yeah. So it's, it's something that we're going to, we have to explore more. Barriers. Yeah. There's definitely some barriers that we put there. So. Any other question? One last question? Okay. How would you, kind of a general business question, how would you, you know, relate your um, principles that have led to your success to, you know, other industries, like on the commercial real estate, you know, how you say you're passionate about stuff, mm -hmm. you know, you kind of have the tech, have that fun type thing going on, you know, what do you recommend to other people trying to... Oh, how do I phrase this? Uh, <laughs> how do you take the passion you see in, like, gaming, and what would you recommend to someone in another industry? Like real estate. Yeah. Um, I think the biggest thing is just being passionate about what you're doing. I mean, I, I obviously I'm very passionate about gaming, but I, I did um, life insurance financial planning for about five years, and I was really passionate about that. I loved it because I believed in what I did. Like I felt that had value, and I could help people. And so I worked really hard at that for most of the time, and when I was playing games. Um, <laughs> but um, I, I was really passionate about it. And that helped me be successful. So I would, you know. I do talk about that sometimes to people that are not in gaming and 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 but want to be successful in what they're doing. And it's, it's finding that thing that really you care about that you feel, you know, feeds your soul. Um, that's important. If it's commercial real estate and you're really passionate about it, then just focus on that. Like, why am I doing this? How can I do this better? Um, kind of 
generic advice, but it's just kind of focusing on the, the why. And um, I think that really helps a lot of the other barriers that you're going to run into when you're doing it. Because um, it's hard. You know, every, hard? everything takes well, if hard you're, Was it hard to go from um, your, your day job banking, which you were passionate to, to gaming? Or was that like a no-brainer? Yeah, no-brainer. I mean, it was just something I was already doing, spending a lot of my time. So, yeah, it was, I, I miss that sometimes. Um, but, you know, I get, I, I work with a lot of other stuff with this, and there's still a lot of finance that I have to do and stuff like this, so. Okay. And then uh, last question from you, uh, for you is, is there anything that, any help that you could ask for from the, the SAC entrepreneur community that you would ask for? Um, uh, how can we help you? Uh, help I guess? me? Um, I need all kinds of help. Um, um, you know, I, honestly, right now, I am looking to build a better network of people that can help other entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. um, I, I kind of see that I have this opportunity right now to, to talk to more people, especially locally, and I want to work on connecting the people. It's, it's, it's funny how often I'll talk to someone and be able to, you know, their need might be somebody that I met the week before mm -hmm. and be able to connect them. and. Um, they'll be able to help each other. So, you know, I, I'm trying as much as I can to meet new people, learn about what they do, um, try and get them connected because I really believe that, you know, building up this area is going to be good for everyone. I mean, I'm, I plan to live here for a long time, raise my kids here, so uh, I have a vested interest in, in building things up. What's that? Okay, well, parting gifts. <laughs> so, uh, you know, this is not a superhero t-shirt. I don't even have one of these, actually. Your own startup grind wow, t-shirt. Wow, cool, thank you. And actually, this is a, this is actually, a, thank you. And this is actually, was made by, a, it's an active duty marine, uh, he's actually a marine helicopter pilot. And he does this on the side. And oh. uh, it's, it's a, thank you for, you know, taking your time and spending with us. Of course. And then, uh, awesome. just to wrap up here, uh, for the, so this pretty much ends the, tonight's presentation. Uh, so we are, our next speaker for next month is Kate Dyers with STEM Express. And uh, actually, this month was supposed to be Women and Entrepreneurs, but uh, Rob, I, I considered asking you to come in and drag. But, uh, <laughs> Maybe uh, next time. Give me a heads up. So uh, she's coming in, um, and then we actually got some swag from, from Google. I actually have two boxes of swag, and I have a box full of women's T-shirts So for, uh, for women. Uh, July 23rd is uh, John... Uh, I always call his name. John Bronziak with uh, Home Zada. Uh, he'll be our speaker uh, the following month. Uh, Lokesh Sikara, who uh, is a ses successful entrepreneur and actually has uh, started his own. Uh, you know, it's one of the dream. He makes so much money that you become an investor. Uh, so he's speaking in August, and uh, he actually has one of the largest early stage venture funds here. Uh, I have a mystery guest in September. Well, I'll say it out loud. It's 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 uh, um, where we've got sort of an approval for for um, a nod from uh, Chris Granger from the Sacramento Kings, the president of the Sacramento Kings, to speak with us. They can't. They won't commit till a month out. And I'm working with Brandon. So if he can't make you know our normal date, we'll we'll try to switch it <laughs> to accommodate him. So that's uh, that's what we're working on in September. And then after that, I'm probably trying to work on some people from the Bay Area to come and speak. Um, you know, this is our second star, uh, second uh, uh, session, so you know, please give me feedback uh, if how things uh, can get better, or uh, you know, how things can better, or things that we can improve on. Uh, we are looking for sponsors, so uh, if your company would like to feel like your sponsors, uh, the uh, startup uh, grind. You know, we're really a community of entrepreneurs. And then, uh, you know, this pretty much ends it, but, you know, there's still plenty of food left. And, uh, you know, go ahead and keep continuing networking. Uh, there's, uh, actually, there's a bunch of gamers here. Uh, you have a recruiter here. We got uh, our resident lawyer here, David. Um, so, you know, talk to one of each other, see if you guys could help each other out. And, again, thank you for coming tonight. Thank you. Thanks, Sarah. Okay. Yeah.